Sebastian, hello, we're back in another show about this incredible radio show which is Culture Shock. <laughs> this week we're going to talk about culture, cognition and change, uh, which is really special because this week we have Dr. Zachary Brooks, who is uh, having the conferences all this week here, so please. <laughs> Hi, yes, I, I am Zachary Brooks, and uh, you can't call me Dr. Zachary Brooks, or I prefer to call myself Dr. Z. If you're in the other, spart uh, other parts of the English-speaking world, you can say Dr. Z. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so he's this very special guest, uh, guest and as always, our hosts. Fernanda. Nathaniel. And Big. So we're going to listen to the Vox Populi, and we're coming back in a few minutes. que a través de la comunicación con nuestros padres, con nuestra familia en sí, o sea, con las personas que nos rodeaban cuando éramos chiquitos, y pues se va transmitiendo, es algo que se va aprendiendo, este, porque tú lo ves, lo es, o sea, lo, es, lo estás escuchando, ves cómo las personas mueven la boca, entonces es una forma de, de aprendizaje, o sea, a través de la como repetición. ¿Y tú crees que los animales tienen una lengua como nosotros o simplemente son animales? No, pues sí tienen una forma de comunicación, este, todo, depende de la especie obviamente, y pues, eh, pero sí, sí, sí tienen, yo sí creo que tengan una forma de cómo se comuniquen, este, pero pues sí tiene, es como una característica propia de la especie. Bueno, ¿y tú cómo te imaginas que nosotros aprendimos a hablar cuando estábamos pequeños? Por imitación y al escuchar a nuestros padres, al repetir lo que ellos decían, al escuchar y ya nosotros no, lo decíamos. ¿Y tú crees que los animales tienen una lengua como nosotros o simplemente son animales y no se comunican? Yo creo que sí tienen este, lengua, bueno, no lengua como tal, pero sí este, como comunicación cierto grado. Okay. ¿Y tú crees que, que, que nosotros ya estamos predispuestos a aprender la lengua o es algo natural? Creo que es algo natural. ¿Y tú cómo te imaginas que nosotros aprendimos a hablar español cuando estábamos pequeños? Pues yo creo que aprendimos gracias a nuestros papás y como las técnicas que nos, nos fueron como fomentando con la, con la misma práctica del habla, siendo que pues así aprendimos. ¿Y tú crees que, que, es, que estamos predispuestos, o sea, tenemos un chip de aprender la lengua o simplemente es algo natural? Yo creo que es algo natural porque pues, o sea, tanto podemos aprender, siento que en un lapso muy corto, como tanto, no sé, lenguas diferentes, tanto el español como el inglés, entonces siento que es como algo pues, natural. ¿Y tú crees que los animales tienen una lengua como nosotros o no se comunican? Yo creo que sí, porque pues de alguna manera pues como que de... No sea tanto como nosotros que literalmente pues hablamos así, sino que tienen como, como algunos rasgos o algunas prácticas que pues saben que que no sé que algún animal está diciendo, no, pues aquí hay comida o aquí hay peligro o algo así, o sea, no tal cual como nosotros, pero sí, creo que sí. Bueno, okay. ¿y tú cómo crees que aprendimos a hablar español cuando estábamos pequeños? Pues yo creo que fue con base a lo que nuestros padres nos enseñaban en el sentido de lo que escuchábamos de ellos, lo que veíamos en el exterior, las personas, nuestra familia, nuestros amigos, nuestros maestros en el kinder. 
¿no? Y también con las herramientas que nos daban nuestros padres, ¿no? Ciertos libros o ciertas este, actividades o dinámicas que nos hacían hacer de niños. ¿Y tú crees que los animales tienen una lengua así como nosotros o no se comunican? Yo creo que sí se comunican, no tienen una lengua en específico, pero sí tienen un sistema de comunicación intuitiva, ¿no? Ya que pues no tienen un, pues como un, una forma de razonar, ¿no? Más que nada actúan con intuición y con una pequeña comunicación, como dije, intuitiva. Ok, muchísimas gracias. ¿Y tú cómo crees que nosotros aprendimos? So, that's what our community thinks about language and culture. So, now please, uh, before... Uh, talking about these topics, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, so, again, Zachary Brooks. I have a doctorate from the University of Arizona. I graduated from the College of Science and the College of Humanities. The actual degree is called Second Language Acquisition and Teaching, and my research is in bilingual decision making. Um, if you want to know more, I can talk more, but uh, <laughs> before I was a B-level Hollywood actor, I worked in Silicon Valley. I've traveled quite a bit as well, so I'm not just an academic. So I'm not sure if there's other questions that come later that you want me to go in, in more depth or if that's enough for now. Uh, it's to know why are you here in Mexico? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'll just walk back Uh, around three months, two and a half months. So in August of this year, 2018, I was in Utah, another state in the United States. I live in Arizona, or I was living in Arizona. I'm not sure what my identity is right now. And my friend was uh, looking after my apartment just to make sure the plants were okay. And she texted me one day and she said, hey, I have a friend from Mexico. He got accepted to University of Arizona. Is it okay if he stays at your place? And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Well, after like... A couple days, his name is Mario, he's from um, Cholula. He said, uh, wh what are you going to be doing now? Because I'm going to be staying in your place. You don't have an apartment. I said, yeah, that's true. I don't have a place to live. I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, well, do you want to live in Mexico? I said, well, sure. And after like two hours, he said, I have an apartment for you in Cholula with my friend, Avi. And so then I came to Cholula. Uh, and then I met people at um, Upaep. And now I'm here in Mexico. But in the last two years, I've spent about four or five months in Mexico, every every place from Chihuahua to Chiapas. So I'm in Mexico often, and Tucson, Arizona is only one hour from Sonora, so I can go to Mexico uh, in one hour when I live in Tucson. So. And of all the of all the different places in Mexico you've visited, um, what what sticks out, um, and what what do you what do you like about uh, being in Pueblo or Cholula? Yeah, I mean, Pueblo <laughs> sticks out because this is probably my longest stay mm -hmm. and I'm starting to feel really comfortable here. I feel like I'm developing a life mm -hmm. uh, here. But uh, what sticks out in Mexico is the food and every place you go to. Generally speaking, Mexicans are extremely friendly um, wherever you go uh, in Mexico. And I've never had any problems in Mexico. As you know, in the United States, sometimes you hear the news stories about how dangerous it is. And then I come here and you know, I'm, I'm very trusting. I never have any problems ever in Mexico. So I find Mexico very safe, great food, the people are wonderful, and then the education institutions, because I've been here many times for talks, are really high end. I mean, there's incredible students here. I mean, some of the best students in the world I've ever met are here in Mexico. So it's just a wonderful experience to be here. And so, I mean, to sort of uh, maybe serve as a segue from from some of your background and into our topic for today. Sure. Um, how, how, how do you, well, how do you feel about your Spanish? Uh, is your uh, living in Mexico, you've traveled here quite a bit, and also uh, what other languages do you speak? And, and to maybe use that to discuss a little bit more about language acquisition in, in your personal context before we get into sure. some of the, uh, the details of the subject. Sure. Bueno, eh, he estado hablando el español desde muchos años. Viví en España, trabajé en bar, como barman norte de Barcelona en, en el país de Cataluña, o la, la región, por supuesto. Y en Arizona, Los Ángeles, otros lugares hay mucho español. Entonces me siento bien que puedo defenderme por lo menos en esta lengua que me encanta. Um, I also speak German. I studied in Germany. Um, I do speak Portuguese at pretty high levels, um, although I haven't really used it for a while. And then I like to do accents because I was an actor in Hollywood, so I had to learn a lot of accents. As far as um, language acquisition, I really think, for me, the this is not an academic thing. It's always about seeing the world through someone else's eyes. So what, what would it be like to be you for a day? 
you know, what would it be like to be you for a day? And that's like an actor's kind of point of view, but also for me, it's a language learner's point of view. If I were this Mexican person in that person's eyes, what would I see? What would I think? What would I feel? How would I behave? And so that's always, always how I approach just as a learner language acquisition. What would it be like to be that person? Uh, well, you're going to be here in Mexico for a while. So, yes, so far, have you experienced any type of culture shock? Um, yeah, I have. You know, it's it's funny because um, the, the word in Spanish you guys have that's really good is desmadre. And, um, you know, I'm compared to many gringos and Americans, I'm probably fairly comfortable. I'm very comfortable in Mexico. But because I'm American, maybe I am, maybe I'm an academic, I still have certain things I expect, like, oh, it's going to work this way. And then it doesn't. And so that's sometimes frustrating for me. And so I think that I have to adjust myself. On the other hand, Mexico is extremely functional and it, it has super high efficiency in Mexico. But there's little things like, I don't know, Uber drivers or something like that that frustrate me and how that works. You know, they say they'll be in five minutes and it's 25 minutes later. And, you know, it's those kind of things. And those are the things that maybe I have the most culture shock with is just how things work sometimes. But you know, I'm here, everything's working fine, and I don't know, I'm very happy in Mexico. But yeah, I have culture shock, um, even though I feel like I shouldn't because I study this, I still have a lot of culture shocks. I'm always a little bit embarrassed that I, I, I don't know better, so. Well, it doesn't matter, you can study a lot, but the experience is the one that the actually gives you the <laughs> yeah, tools. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, now first of all, we're gonna talk about culture. So, there are a lot of theories, but what's culture? for Dr. Zachary Brooks. Yeah, someone said it the other day, I'll borrow what someone said, it's what you do and who you are. I forget who, did you say this? Or? No. no, I didn't. Actually, the one that did the box purple eye said that. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was I mean, oh, the way at, she at said the, it. Uh, at your seminar. Yeah, my seminar. Okay. Yeah, there was a student, what's her name? Do you happen to know? Alice. Alice, yeah, she said it's who you are and what you do. And that's beautiful. It's a really beautiful definition of culture because it captures everything in a very simplistic, um, way, but I, I think it's a very powerful way to think about it. And so how does this, so this idea of culture and, and because it, it is a word that gets bandied about quite a bit. Um, and so when we talk about a culture being, you know, a, a group of people and who they are and what they do. Um, and, and so, but then we get into questions of intercultural relationships and intercultural competence for language learners, but also travelers and this sort of thing. And, and it, could, you, could you give us a little um, a little bit of insight into that and what these, these sorts of terms mean? Yeah, so I'll start with something I talked about yesterday called the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. I think it's a pretty old model, 1988 or 1992 by Bennett and Bennett. And it has six stages. And um, the first three stages are ethnocentric, very much my culture is the best. And the next ones are more, I think it's called ethno-relative. I should know, but I, I'm pretty sure it's ethno-relative where you kind of interact with cultures. And you go from this phase of denial, I, you know, these cultural differences don't exist, to defense, like, well, mine is still better. You kind of accept cultures. Eventually, you sort of get to the next phases of um, acceptance and adaptation in the final phase is integration. And so I think that's a nice way to think about intercultural competence that there's, there's different stages. And I don't think that the stages are one way you can go from denial all the way to acceptance, but sometimes you step back a stage because maybe there's a new, uh, set of circumstances that are difficult and you know, it, it's hard for you, or maybe you have a really strong identity, one particular part of your personality, and you can't move from that. And so you only stay at this um, acceptance phase, but not integration. So I think um, intercultural competence, um, also as a study, I, I don't think it's, I think it's sometimes extremely hard to study because you can just talk forever about it. And you can think it's not real, but the second you go to a new country and you arrive in that new airport, all of these things become very, very real. The language, the culture, how you greet someone, what politeness means in another place. And so these things are extremely real for anyone who's traveled or anyone who attempts to speak a second language. Okay, and before we go to a brief cut, uh, what's perception? Uh, perception is uh, a mental 
operation that your your brain so in in visual cognition there's sort of two concepts i'll talk about in this way feed forward and feedback so feed forward is that you start with electrochemical signals they hit your eye and eventually in the occipital lobe the back of your brain your brain will build up this image so i'm going to look at a computer i see lines and eventually those lines develop to become a computer but in the meantime as i'm looking at this my brain has seen a computer before so it starts to form that image before the image is formed by the electrochemical uh, uh, chemicals. So perception is sort of two things. One, it's, it's the building up of an image, but it's also the push down of an image of images you've seen before. So perception is very much a, a mental operation where you're trying to make sense of the world with the limitations of your brain. Okay, so. so we have so we have some interesting and important terms here. We have perception, we have cultural, we have intercultural competence, mm -hmm. um, and so what we're trying to understand is how how all of these start to fit together. Um, how does how does, so how, in if culture is who we are and what we do, um, and perception is this this process that you describe. Um, how do these, how can we sort of relate these to one another? Well, that's kind of what I'm trying to do this week. I mean, I, I think the fact that um, Upayep and the people here were smart enough to say, yeah, we want to do this week-long um, series with Dr. Z, that's me, um, starting with intercultural competence to brain and, brain and language, ending the week with adaptive leadership. I think that's what Upayep is trying to do is figure out how these connections are made. For me... Um, all these connections are very um, obvious because I've studied them, but now I'm trying to make these connections more obvious to people who haven't. So if um, we understand the brain better, then we can certainly understand um, why we might perceive something a certain way. And that perception is many times culture. You know, if that culture is reality or not, that's a different question. But sometimes perception is reality. Mm -hmm. So if you perceive um, your grandmother's desires in a certain way, that is a very strong cultural thing, but it's just your perception that comes from, from your brain. So if you understand how the brain operates and how, uh, uh, understands how that can operate uh, on and with a particular cultural construct, then you can start to make these connections between just a behavior that you're using in your family or in the streets or something like that and your brain. Okay, well, it, it looks like we're up on a break right Beautiful. now. Beautiful. Um, but we will want to ask some more questions about about these co connections and, and how how you see them uh, Beautiful. in just a minute. transformen a la sociedad en la búsqueda de la verdad integrando fe ciencia y vida valores junto a la verdad el bien y la belleza nuestra universidad sostiene como valores rectores la dignidad de la persona humana la libertad la solidaridad la subsidiariedad la congruencia el respeto el amor y la justicia visión visión 
Somos una comunidad universitaria fraterna, congruente, alegre y comprometida, que es referente en la conjunción del pensamiento humanista, cristiano y las ciencias, que forma integralmente líderes con alta calidad profesional y compromiso social. Contribuye a la transformación de la sociedad con propuestas pertinentes, orientadas a la consecución del bien común. Tiene presencia e influencia en los ámbitos local, regional, nacional e internacional. Centra la gestión en la persona y optimiza los recursos al servicio de la misión institucional. Líneas Rectoras Atreverse a vivir congruentemente nuestra identidad, como ejemplo de virtud en el servicio, con respeto y amor al prójimo, para la transformación social en orden al bien común. Privilegiar a través de la academia la formación humanista cristiana en busca de la excelencia científica y profesional con pensamiento universal y trascendencia social. Crear sistemas académicos de auténtica pertinencia social, a través de la docencia, investigación y extensión, para enriquecer la cultura y participar en la solución de los problemas fundamentales del país. Involucrarse en la formación y desarrollo intercultural de la comunidad universitaria, a través de ámbitos y vínculos de internacionalización. Lograr ambientes de confianza, colaboración y servicio dentro de una cultura de austeridad, transparencia y evaluación. UPAEP, rumbo al 50 aniversario. Puebla, mi vida, mi universidad, mi espacio. Comienza mi historia. Octubre 2018. Soy UPAEP. Welcome back to Culture Shock, and we have here Dr. Zacharias Brooks. And continue with our topic. Uh, tell me what is the relation between culture and our perception? Well, I think uh, easy examples for people, um, you know, people in, in the group I'm with right now in the radio studio, they, they know because they study these things. But anyone who hasn't uh, thought of these things before, I think two kind of ways to think about it would be color, uh, color and the language itself. So. Um, a famous example that people talk about is Eskimos. So Eskimos are an indigenous tribe in, in the northern parts of North America, so northern Canada, Alaska, those places. And they have multiple words for white and snow and so forth because they deal with various um, colors of white and snow and so forth. That's an example that people use a lot. And, you know, we in the United States speaking English or in, in, in Mexico speaking Spanish, we might only have one word or maybe just a couple words for the word white, you know, white, blanco, and so forth. So that's one way that uh, language and culture and the brain and perception interact very clearly. If you only have one word for um, a certain thing, you can perceive things. Maybe your eyes can actually see those different variants of color, but you only have one word that can apply uh, like a label like to that particular phenomenon. So that's one way to think about how um, culture and perception interact. And the other one is about language itself. So if we were to suddenly start speaking Spanish, there would be limitations on us that we would put on us by the language, but we would also have much more freedom in other ways to speak about certain things um, because of the, the language. So uh, one example is um, Spanish. M many people when I drive with Uber drivers, they always ask me, bueno, de donde eres? Si de donde es usted? Ya. Yeah. They ask me things about myself, and they always, and not always, I would say half the time, they ask me, what's the hardest part about Spanish? And the hardest part about Spanish is the verbs in many ways, because the conjugations are so complex and difficult. And so um, that, um, those sounds are physical, chemical instruments that drive on our perception of the world, and they, they, they create the world for us. If you're speaking Spanish with these verb conjugations, um, you have a very different perception of the world than you do with English with simply two uh, verb conjugations. Walk, walks, you know, in Spanish. You know, camino, caminas, camina, cam, caminamos. In Spain, caminais, caminan, right? And, and that's a very different kind of thing. So I think those are two easy ways to think about how perception and culture and language interact is, is the language we use. Um, Even if we, as humans, can perceive a variety of things, it's the language itself that categorizes the world in ways that we can express ourselves 
with more latitude or less latitude? Uh, so, well, I have talking about that, like fun facts, there are tribes in Africa mm -hmm. that think, that believe because of their perceptional culture that our green and our blue are the same color, mm -hmm. but they have different words for dark red and light red. So mm -hmm. that's also about yeah, that's a great example. colors. Also, one thing that I cannot imagine is that there's a tribe in the Amazon mm -hmm. that do not use numbers at all, just one or many. Yeah. So I cannot picture, I cannot imagine a life without numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so exactly. That's, there's a, that's, that story. Uh, also, I once read something called systemic linguistic distortion, mm -hmm. which I understood that it's how one word can have different connotations. So we can have different images about it. For example, if we say here in Mexico that someone is energetic, maybe well, in Espanol, energético, uh, we have the idea that he's someone happy and, oh, uh, and interesting. joyful and who loves life and always smiling and stuff. Yeah. But maybe in English, energetic means that it's kind of aggressive. So even though it's the same word, uh, there are different paths according to the language you, yeah. you speak. No, I think you're right. The cognates are very uh, good examples of language and perception. Um, one thing that this is reminding me of is, um, and I don't know if you can speak to this specifically, but um, there's a popular TED Talk in which, and I'm not the biggest fan of TED Talks personally, but <laughs> um, but it, it, it's been, uh, several people have referenced it to me over the years, um, talking about, I mean, specifically the Romance languages with gender uh, and the uses of gender. Mm -hmm. um, and so is that, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the TED talk I'm mentioning about how... Is this the bridge? Yeah. yeah. And and I was wondering if you could speak, to, I mean, I'm in no way a, a linguist or, or and, 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 and um, don't study language per se. I'm uh, more on the, in, in the literature field, but... Um, is that is now is that something that you've come across in your research and um, I mean I can only recount what you shared mm -hmm. I mean the the research in German I think it was a German and French mm -hmm. started so German has three articles da die das da mm -hmm. is masculine die is feminine and das is neutral mm -hmm. and the French has to le la so masculine and feminine mm -hmm. and then the bridges you know either have a masculine form because of the language or a feminine form mm -hmm. And what comes from that, so this is sort of a psycho psychological term like priming. Mm -hmm. So if you give someone a set of words or an expression, then they're more likely to later express something or think something or see something quicker because mm -hmm. they're primed okay. to see something or think something later. So in those particular studies, if you have a bridge that has a masculine article, um, then people are more likely to give masculine adjectives mm -hmm. associated with that noun. The reverse is also true. If you have a bridge with a feminine article, mm -hmm. people are more likely to give feminine adjectives mm -hmm. associated with that bridge. You know, beauty would be one versus, mm -hmm. you know, strength or something like that. Okay. So that's kind of what that's applying okay. to. So it's also a great example of how language, culture, perception okay. interact. And so, so that would, that would, um, I mean, some of our other our other notes here that you guys um, that you guys included, um, so so that would connect back to perhaps the the way that culture um, and not only connects with language and perception, but also with our own personality and identity. Or well, that's a that's a really hard question. Okay, uh, I mean, I call it the specter of individual differences. So when you get into you know the world of humanities or social behavior sciences. Um, you know, hard, you know, people take science and social behavior sciences extremely seriously as they should. And some of the frustration is social behavior sciences don't behave like natural sciences, such as physics or chemistry. Mm -hmm. And physics and chemistry, there can be one objective answer. But in the world of social behavior sciences, you get trends and you get tendencies. But then the question often is asked and it's a very valid question is like well that's just an individual difference between people and could you just expand that idea of just an individual difference between between people who speak different languages and so that one is a very i think hard question to ans uh, answer mm -hmm. scientifically uh, because there's so many confounds i mean different things that can explain the same phenomenon with the same set of facts the same same set of data and things that i ran into a lot in my bilingual decision-making research, the this this thing about individual differences. 
Hello. So not long time ago, you mentioned about intercultural relations. So why do you think we need to coexist with other cultures? Um, that's a, I liked your question. Um, how do you answer that exactly? I mean, I guess we could start with the opposite. We don't need to, right? I don't need to have a friend. You know, I don't need to have a Mexican friend. I don't need to have a German friend. I don't need to have a Canadian friend. I don't need to have a friend who has a different skin tone. I don't need to have a female friend. Um, let's say you could live like that theoretically, but then you would say, well, why? You know, females are nice. And so is my friend from another part of the country. And my friend from Mexico is extremely nice too. And I like him because he brings something to my life that I don't have, or my friend from Germany or so forth. So I think uh, your question, like why need, you know, need, you know, in some way we don't need these things. You could say that, but then why? And the world has become so interconnected you know, I know there's people in the United States right now and other parts of the world who would like to say, well, we want to become more proud about our own country and more nationalistic, the rest of it. But honestly, I think the connections that we make right now in the, this moment with you guys and with our friends from around the world, you talked about this African thing. I don't think we want to go back once we make those connections because we like those connections and we value those connections and those connections become a part of our lives and who we are. So if we accept that we like the connections we're making and, and how this has become a part of our life, then we might as well be smart about it and get better. Just like, you know, a relationship with someone, you want to get better at that relationship to get to know that person. The same principles expand across the world. You want to get better and intercultural competency and studying that is a way to get better at relationship building. Okay, well, I've got a question about cross-cultural and intercultural relations. Mm -hmm. As there are some cultures that are way too different, or maybe even the opposite mm -hmm. to what we uh, believe as a culture. So how can you solve this personality difference when you are meeting someone from a different culture? Uh, if, if uh, for example, I'm giving a class and I like my students to, to keep eye contact, but they don't, how can you find this balance between mm -hmm. both parts of the equation? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I read in a blog, but I've probably seen it before too. You guys might have seen the same thing about uh, travelers who've traveled a lot of the world, more than you or I or anyone else in this room have traveled. And they say, you know, it's fundamentally people want to be loved and respected. So I think, you know, if you start with that uh, point of view, then you can start building on that. As far as like your particular question, um, when I've taught in the United States with a room full of Chinese students and a room of Arabic speaking students, those are sort of like complete opposite groups as far as their student behavior. Um, so for the people who don't know, so Chinese students um, and generally East Asian students tend to be much more quiet in the classroom. They won't ask questions because for them, that's not good student behavior. For them, good student behavior is being quiet, listening intently and taking notes. For someone from, the, let's say, the Gulf states, those students, for them, good student behavior is asking lots of questions, but interrupting the teacher all the time, but teacher, but teacher, but teacher, <laughs> right, all the time. And so, you know, United States, you know, it's important to kind of do both of those. We kind of respect both of those ideas, but we want people to raise their hands, you know, and then the teacher will call on people in turn. So John raised his hand first, Sarah raised her hand second and so forth. So I think as a teacher, if we're talking about a teaching environment, I think you need to set the expectations up front. This is how we want to do it there. We respect, you know, you raising your hand and we respect you taking notes. And we know those are good behaviors in your country. So I think that's where intercultural competence can help. If you know those are the behaviors that are expected and those expect those behaviors are considered good behaviors in your country, if you know that already, then it can help them make the transition to a different type of behavior, a different behavior in a different country, especially in a classroom context. Okay, well, I've got another example. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It is more I don't know, difficult, rough. Uh, for, let's say, I'm in another country where they are pretty individualistic people. So I get sick and I'm in the hospital. Obviously, I, as Mexican, I would love to have them visit and stay there with me and play and have a party in the dressing room. Yeah. But if they are like, okay, you're sick, I'm going to respect your space. I'm going to stay at home. <laughs> so how can you, yeah. you, obviously I want attention because that's why my culture tells me, <laughs> mm -hmm. but they are not providing it. So how can you find the balance there? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, 
you know, I know American hospitals, um, especially in the larger cities, you know, Philadelphia, um, Tucson, Arizona, where there's a lot of um, Spanish speakers and there's a lot of uh, native tribes. There's 22 native tribes in the state of Arizona. So I think bigger cities in the United States, that probably wouldn't be a, as big a problem. The reason why is because a lot of the nurses and doctors there are very familiar with different customs. So they'll probably try to make some accommodations because I've been in the hospital um, a couple times now in Tucson where you get um, Mexican families and they come, like 10 of them come to the room, <laughs> right? And so it's obvious there that they're very comfortable with that, but then they have American families who are like one come at a time. And so, you know, those kind of places, I imagine Philadelphia, and I keep pointing to Philadelphia because the one of the right. interviewers has lived there in Philadelphia most recently. These are very dynamic cities, so they have a lot of different cultures there. But, you know, as far as that, that question, you know, if you're not in a city like that, that's, that's a really hard thing to deal with. This is where culture becomes extremely real and extremely painful. If you have an expectation that people are going to visit you in the hospital and they don't because they can't, then culture is very real and it's very painful because the thing you grew up with expecting doesn't happen. That it's not just culture anymore, it's your physical body. You know, grew up with these expectations. So that's a very real thing. I don't know if there's an answer for that because, but that's a, mo that's a nice example where culture is, is not just an academic conversation. It's something very physical. We are coming up on a break, but um, <laughs> we got the signal just a moment ago. Uh, but uh, so we, have you, have you seen, um, I mean, can you, Thinking about the the time you've spent in Mexico, um, do you see any any of these in particular? Oh, we are uh, just up on a break, but but when perhaps when we get back from the break, have you? Uh, so Victor gave us some examples of him, of of uh, traveling abroad and and different experiences, and we, uh, we're wondering, you know, about about your experiences here in Mexico, maybe maybe helping you to better understand your own field and sure. expand your thinking on it. But also, uh, I think we'll probably want to get into some other questions about uh, education and interculturality and some of the, you know, some of the buzzwords that we hear these days, such as cultural appropriation and cultural assimilation and, and some of these big themes. Uh, so we will be back in just a moment uh, with Radio Culture Shock. Puebla, mi vida, mi universidad, mi espacio, comienza mi historia, octubre de 2018, soy UPAEP. Vida de Estudiambre presenta un espacio cultural. Pide el tiempo que vuelva. Es una película ubicada en 1980. Esta película nos demuestra que el tiempo es subjetivo mientras existe algo que nos acerque a la persona que queremos y que una moneda tiene el poder de hacernos volver al pasado. ¿Te gustaría crear o mejorar dispositivos para el servicio de seres vivos, tales como prótesis, órtesis e instrumental biomédico? ¿Qué estás esperando? La Escuela de Ingeniería Biónica de la UPAEP te invita a conocer cómo un ingeniero biónico domina y aplica las habilidades de elementos mecánicos, electrónicos y biológicos en las personas. Conoce nuestro plan de estudios conformado por nueve cuatrimestres con líneas terminales en diseño y manufactura de prótesis, emprendedores e instrumentación biomédica. Con un campo de trabajo que va desde el sector salud, automotriz y aeroespacial. Para más información comunícate al teléfono 229-9400 00 extensión 7146 o consulta la página www.upaep.mx Ingeniería Biónica Calidad de vida en tus manos Hazlo tuyo Hazlo UPAEP
So we're back, uh, unfortunately, on our last segment of the show, <laughs> uh, because this has been really, really interesting. Uh, so now that we've discussed what's culture and how it affects the way we see the world, uh, when someone who is able to speak two or more languages, how does that affect, how does that affect the way he uh, makes his choices and decisions? Yeah, um, thanks. That's, that's a great question. So that's actually um, what I studied for my PhD. So it took two years and I um, found 2,000 participants. That's why it took two years. It takes a long time to find that many participants. And I asked that basic question, how someone's language competence affects their decision making. So for example, would a uh, second language speaker of English make a different decision than someone who speaks English as a first language? Or if I'm in the United, if I'm in Mexico, would a first language speaker of Spanish make a different decision than someone who speaks Spanish as a second language? That's the basic fundamental question I asked. And um, the first part of the answer I'll give is I really like, and I also like the second part. The first part is in many cases, there's no difference. And the reason why is because I think we're human. We have human brains. We don't have bird brains. We have human brains. So why would you and I, you speak Spanish as a first language and I speak English as a first language, why would we process the world that differently to make a decision that's different? Um, and I would say that's like 90% of the time. But there are certain, certain moments where decisions can change, I believe, as a result um, of your second language. And every time I did any test, I had more than 200 people and the reason I had so many is because I wanted to make sure there was enough statistical power in my analyses to say, oh, there is actually a difference there because many times these studies have 10 people or 15 or even 30 or 40, but that's a pretty small number. So I'll give um, one example at least. So the word in English probable, in Spanish probable, if you say it's probably going to rain tomorrow, and I say, well, okay, well, give me a number. And you say, you know, 60% or 65% and she says 75% well that's interesting because these words embody numbers and then I, that's what I did for my research I just asked people these sentences with probable rare unlikely these kind of words and what I found is that second language speakers give higher numbers than first language speakers give higher numbers than first language speakers and that was fascinating and I said why would that be and how are they processing the world that differently that they would give different numbers. And people would say, well, there's a mapping issue. This is a very much a culture thing. Well, maybe in their language, they don't have these words. Or maybe the way they use probable in Spanish is different than probab or probable is different than probable. Those are explanations too. But I think actually the explanation is that when you're using your second language, you want to give yourselves more opportunities to be correct. And you want to give yourselves fewer opportunities to be incorrect. Because you're trying to make um, yourself good in a new place. So you're using language in a way that optimizes and helps you process the world and make yourself um, better in that new world. So that was one kind of interesting thing. There's other um, things about ethics that are really fascinating about are we different ethical people when we use our second language? Are we nicer people or are we less nice? Are we more likely to make decisions that would hurt people or are we more likely to make decisions that would help people when we use our second language because some people say we're less emotional when we use our second language so if we're less emotional maybe we make more rational decisions but maybe some of those rational decisions can also be not nice decisions you know those are also sort of questions and the final one and if anyone in the who's listening to this now or later you can take out a piece of paper this is my favorite one um so if you have a bat and you have a ball, the bat costs $1 more than the ball. So the bat and the ball together cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So before you answer that, you, you, we can answer it later too. <laughs> so you have this little thing. It's, it's not a mathematical thing. I'll repeat it again and then I'll continue. So. You have a bat, a baseball bat, and you have a ball. Together, they cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? So what I found really fascinating, I asked this question to first and second language speakers, and guess who did better? 
Yeah. Second language speakers. Mm -hmm. Why would second language speakers do better in a particular, particular thing? Well, I don't think we have time right now, but what I find fascinating is what I found in this particular study, there's advantages to being a second language speaker, which I thought was the most ex extremely interesting thing I found in my research. And there's other research that kind of suggests um, sometimes there's big advantages to be a second language speaker in a first language environment because of the way you process the world. So this is how your first culture and your first perceptions transferring into your second language can give you advantages. And that's nice because oftentimes we think, oh, it must be worse to be a second language speaker, but maybe sometimes it's actually better. If we understand how it's worse and how it's better, then I think we can function in the second world we live in better. Anyway, that was a long answer to your first question. So, what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> ah, so, all together cost $1.10, mm -hmm. the bad animal. Let's say the ball costs $0.05. Cents. Okay. Math that you don't need to use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm studying. <laughs> so, I'll repeat it, um, and then I'll give the answer. Okay. So, um, there's a baseball bat, and there's a ball, a baseball. And together they cost one dollar and ten cents. The bat costs one dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Almost everyone, first and second language speakers, give the instinctual answer, which is ten cents. Yeah. Yeah. Almost everyone. Period. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter wh who you are in the world, right? It's how it just how it is. Yeah. And the reason why that's very plausible. It's very logical. And it, it's the using our system one thinking, which is the fast, instinctive thinking. Mm -hmm. In order to solve the problem, you probably need to use your second type of thinking, which is called system two, which is slower, more rational, more thought, thoughtful. Well, if you're a second language speaker and you're already processing the world slower, maybe you're more ready to answer that question. So the actual correct answer is five cents, because if you have a bat mm -hmm. that's one dollar and five cents, and the ball is five cents, that equals one ten. One, one ten, and it also means that the difference between a dollar five and five cents is one dollar. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the answer, but almost everyone gives. Yeah, like one dollar, yeah. straightforward. So now you can go to your family tonight and say, <laughs> una bate, una pelota, junto, cuesten un dolor de centavos. El bate cueste un dolor más que la pelota. ¿Cuánto cuesta la pelota? And everyone will think you're the most genius person <laughs> ever. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think that's something like you're kind of studying for your dissertation, right? <coughs> so what are you... What's your dissertation about? Because I think it, they are kind of related. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so ashamed. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to do my thesis on emotions in the second language because I do believe that uh, when you speak a language and maybe you're angry and you want to, I mean, I don't know, my native language is Spanish, so I'm speaking English. Mm -hmm. And when I get very, very angry and I cannot show that anger in English, maybe because of my vocabulary or because I don't feel the same anger as in Spanish, I make this code switching. That's mm -hmm. what I'm mm. studying for, maybe. I don't yeah, know. so there's a researcher named Albert, Alberto Costa. I think it's Alberto Costa. Ah, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's I in saw Spain. Him. Yes. He does a lot of that. Um, I don't always agree with that. I think sometimes you can be, um, I don't think it's always less emotional in the second language, but he has lots of research that suggests mm -hmm. exactly that. Yeah. No. So, uh, I don't know if you know something, but can you tell us something about code switching, maybe? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, go ahead. That, that, that's a word that you hear more and more uh, yeah. these days. There. But, sorry, just to... Yeah, no, <laughs> so, no, so code switching, for people who don't know, it's just like it sounds, um, you're switching from one code to the other. In the world of language, it's switching from one language to, a, to another. So you switch between English and Spanish. So a famous example is Spanglish. Oye, como esta? Vamos al mall because, you know, I want some food. Oye, no, no, no tengo hambre. That's your problem. <laughs> you know, that's Spanglish. But the thing about code switching, it, it's actually very rule. You guys probably know this. Very rule-based. No. <laughs> that you can only switch at certain points where the grammatical uh, structure allows you to switch. And does this have... Uh, so we are almost up on time but uh, a couple other things we wanted to talk about so so can we connect code switching it seems like 
that would connect with cultural assimilation and some of these questions about, or um, how, how can um, how can we think about some of these other important phenomena? Um, yeah, culture I think and language. code switching you can be seen as a, a bootstrapping idea that it's on on your way to maybe it's an intercultural, uh, not intercultural, interlanguage phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So as you're learning your second language, you switch a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, while you're learning the second language, eventually become proficient enough, you don't need to code switch. You can look at it like that. There's many different ways to look at code mm -hmm. switching, but that would be one way to look at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so before we go, I've got a question for all of you, <laughs> <laughs> including myself. <laughs> so, uh, well, we both speak Spanish as our first language. You speak English as your first language. So, in... I don't know, in this cross-cultural encounter. Uh, do you have a, a word in Spanish that represents a concept that you cannot translate? Yeah, um, I'm not sure what that word is at the moment. Desmadre, I used it earlier, so it just comes to mind because I think it captures something. That, desmadre. <laughs> yeah, it captures something beautiful um, because when I use that word, I see something very different. And when I go to the United States, I can't use the translation. It would be like mess. You know, it just doesn't work. No, I think this matter is stronger than this. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. why. That's why. So it just doesn't, <laughs> it just, it has something that's so strong. And I really love the word because I can use it and it's very clear. And I understand the world better when I use it. I understand, I understand Mexico better when I use it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nathaniel, do you have a word like that? I'm trying to think of one. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that is a good example. Um, I guess also... Some of the some of the terms like chido or padre esta padre esta chido they have a I mean the you can think of maybe a bit easier to translate but they just I mean I, I think it also has to do with vocal intonation and these sorts of things in the context and mm -hmm. the way they're also used to punctuate um, I think uh, what do you mean by punctuate Give sort of sort of the way that they punctuate thought you know spoken language mm -hmm. is sort of punctuate but i don't know the linguistic terms but it's sort of like these these filler words that are sort of used as commas or or sort of as punctuation verbal punctuation marks um, cool. or sort of like uh, or or like uh, neta things like that right um the words that are thrown in a lot and in and specifically in mexican spanish so, so sort of they, they give structure to a conversation um mm -hmm. and i sort That's of un cool. understanding are getting used to the frequency and the ways those are used in oh, wow. variations. That's um, sophisticated. That's hard. I, well, and that's the thing. It, it, I don't think I fully understand it, but starting to sort of get a grip on it, I think, um, or noticing patterns definitely helps. I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. How about but, you guys with English? Um, with English, well, I really don't know. But at least in Spanish, there's a word that I always want to translate in English, and I don't know how, how to translate it or how to explain it, which is amargado. Bitter? Yeah, but you don't say to a person it's bitter. Or yes? He's a bitter person. Yeah, you say yeah, it. People can be. Oh, really? Because I tried to explain that to a friend, and he was like, what? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I love that word. Okay, for me, well, in education, to address or to meet a goal and stuff like that, but for you know my daily life speaking i think afford is the concept that i cannot translate because right. in mexico afford is like presupuestar something like that but it, that that has to right. do only with money uh, so i can afford a car that means that i cannot buy it but uh we only use that word first for money mm -hmm. and in english you can use it like i cannot afford another absence because if i do then mm -hmm. they're i'm gonna mm -hmm. they're gonna fail me oh interesting so i cannot say no me puedo presupuestar otra falta because presupuesto just for money. Uh -huh. So afford is a concept that I cannot translate in. I, I Spanglish whenever I need yeah. to say that. Yeah, yeah. To afford. That's cool. Thanks for sharing. Okay, well, I think we are just about up at, at the end of this show. Uh, another uh, very hearty thank you to Dr. Zachary Brooks. Um, it's a blessing. Thank you very much. We look forward to... Uh, you have three remaining talks this week, tonight and Thursday, Friday? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Excellent. And I know you guys will be in attendance. I hope many of our <laughs> audience members will be as well. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I'm your faculty host, Nathaniel. I'm Fernanda. I'm Vic. And Zacharias, Zachary Brooks.
our okay. special guest. Thanks Thank for you. joining us on Radio Culture Shock. We'll see you next week. Thanks, guys.